There are millions of disease-causing organisms on our planet. Animals, like humans, get sick. But far from suffering in silence, animals take action. The meek and the mighty of the animal world share one important habit. They self-medicate. We set off to uncover how animals fight sickness and disease. Microbes are lowly organisms, but among the toughest and most successful of all the Earth's inhabitants. Parasites like lice can carry these germs and pass them on to animals. In feeding off other organisms, they transmit disease-causing pathogens. To survive, animals must put a stop to both pathogens and their carriers. The old adage, prevention is better than a cure, holds true as much for the animal kingdom as for our own society. In the Mahale National Park in Tanzania, East Africa, simple hygiene is the first rule of thumb. Parasites feed off warm blood. Once lodged in the skin, a female tick will gorge herself until she reproduces. A serious attack could weaken this young rhesus macaque through blood loss. What's more, ticks carry the bacterial pathogens which cause typhus and Lyme's disease. A curious behaviour called lip smacking accompanies another grooming session in the Mahale Park. Grooming rituals last up to three hours a day. It's an effective way of removing parasites and minimising the danger of disease. No body part is overlooked. Lice eggs are picked off with lips, fingers, even leaves and eaten. Grooming to prevent disease may be one reason why some primates live in groups, but it also plays another role in ape and monkey society. It's a way of making new friends and renewing old acquaintances. Simple preening, however, doesn't do the job. But starlings have hit on an ingenious method of cleaning their feathers. European wood ants produce highly concentrated formic acid to ward off predators and catch prey. Starlings have another use for it. They brush the ants against their feathers. In doing so, they could be calming itchiness from feather growth, as formic acid is a pain reliever. It is also lethal to feather mites. 
Some ants give off other chemicals like fatty acids, which can kill microbes. Anting is in fact an all-round skin and feather care strategy for starlings. The poor wood ants, meanwhile, have health problems of their own. Tens of thousands of them live in this warm, food-rich nest. It's an ideal breeding ground for bacteria and fungi. To prevent germs spreading, ants too practice strict hygiene, starting with disposing of their dead. They also take out the garbage, spent pupa shells, meal leftovers, and anything else likely to decay is thrown out. When dead ants decompose, they give off pungent chemicals called pheromones, a cue for the undertakers to move in. A funeral march ends unceremoniously. The ants park their dead and rubbish in specific sites on the boundaries of their territory, a safe distance from their nest. If the starling looks to the venomous wood ant for relief, other animals need look no further than the tip of their tongue. Even domestic dogs pay more attention to hygiene than we might first think. This bitch is not just grooming, she's actually licking away pathogens, killing them with chemicals in her mouth. Two strains of bacteria, E. coli and S. carnis, can be fatal to newborn pups, which catch them when suckling. <laughs> Professor Ben Hart's research at the School of Veterinary Medicine in Davis, California, found that not only dog, but cat and rat saliva act as powerful antiseptics, keeping wounds clean and preventing sexually transmitted diseases. The evolutionary ancestors of our domestic animals and other animals living in nature uh, don't have veterinary services around. There's no one giving them vaccinations, no one treating them when they get sick, no one's caring for them. And yet they, they survive quite well, they thrive in fact. And so there's gotta be something to animals taking care of themselves so that they can actually, and in fact, look about as healthy as the ones that we have under our own care. Basic hygiene keeps most animals healthy and strong, but feeding habits are important too, especially in the wild, where the weak quickly go to the wall. We strike east across the Atlantic to Scotland to film, for the first time ever, some extraordinary scenes. The island of Rum is part of the Inner Hebrides archipelago, which sits off the west coast of Scotland. Weather is harsh, and the island's soil poor and thin. Red deer were introduced to Rum in the 18th century. Their natural habitat is forest, but here they've had to adapt to rocky coasts, granite hillsides, and bleak moors. The deer struggle to find the food and minerals they need to survive and are consequently small for their species. However, the lengths they go to supplement their diet took one scientist quite by surprise. Professor Bob Furness is a seabird specialist at the University of Glasgow. Setting out one day to study the island's summer population of Manx shearwater birds, he made a discovery that cast the red deer's struggle for survival in an entirely new light. Towards the end of August, before the long winter months set in, adult shearwaters abandon their chicks to migrate back to the South Atlantic. Under cover of night, the chicks emerge from their nesting burrows to practice flying in preparation for their first long journey south. Heat-seeking infrared cameras capture the spectacle of the Shearwater's maiden flights.
Beneath the rum sky, the deer graze around shearwater burrows where the grass is enriched by bird droppings. For chicks still grounded, the deer present a mortal threat. We just noticed a deer casually pick up a shearwater chick and walk around with it in its mouth and then start chewing. And it chewed it really carefully for about 15 or 20 minutes and then dropped it. And we were amazed to find that the, all the bones in the wing had been chewed out, but the wing had been left behind. And the bones in the legs had been chewed out, but the feet were still attached to the body by the tendons and, and the skin. Far from being hungry for meat, Bob Furness believes the deer hunger for the calcium in the bird's bones. This mineral is crucial for skeletal and antler growth, and the deer are in need of a dietary supplement. It's quite clear that the animals are, are doing this very deliberately. They know exactly what they're picking up, and they know exactly how to manipulate it to get the bone out. And it, it's quite a sensible thing for them to be doing because this improves their body condition, it improves their, their reproductive output. So there's obviously a strong selective pressure to find the, the minerals that they need. Even if it means abandoning their strict herbivore diet, animals like the red deer on rum will go to unusual lengths to find the minerals they need for good health. One mineral in particular is absolutely essential and animals will roam far and wide to satisfy their hunger for it. Elephants risk injury and death to find the right spots in remote underground caves. Here, we're high in the Aberdare National Park in Kenya's central highlands. The stuff these elephants prize so highly is nothing more than the salt of the earth. Salt plays a vital role in their lives as it does in ours. Like water and air, we simply wouldn't be alive without it. But in the wild, it can be difficult to find enough. Plants contain only small quantities, hardly adequate to meet the 100 grams or so an elephant requires daily to stay healthy. Salt protects mammals' bodies from fluid loss, but it's released in sweat and urine. If salt levels fall, these elephants will dehydrate and eventually die. They return to the same salt licks time and time again, because their lives, like those of the buffalo and other mammals, depend on it. The appetite for salt is so strong that feeding continues after dark. By day, all these mammals feed on leaves and grasses, but the vegetation which makes up their diet is full of poisonous chemicals. Salt intake serves a second medical purpose. Not only does it prevent dehydration, salt is used in detoxification, neutralizing poisonous plant compounds in the gut. Animals and plants have a love-hate relationship, a story as old as the history of life on Earth itself. Plants can provide animals with nutrition and medication, but can also make them sick. In their parallel evolution with animals, plants developed strong frontline defenses against attack. 
physical deterrents like barbs, prickles and bark make it difficult for animals to eat them. Plants also produce some very effective chemical weapons. Beneath thick bark, toxic compounds like alkaloids and tannins lurk in resin and sap. These poisons are sent to stalks and leaves, areas vulnerable to assault, giving them a bitter taste and discouraging predators. Herbivores encounter this jungle of lethal substances on a daily basis. So why don't they get sick? We journey to the Spice Islands, to Zanzibar, off the Tanzanian coast, for an insight into how some animals cope with plant poisoning. Rainforest soils are poor in nutrients, and the trees growing here protect their leaves with high doses of defensive compounds. Indian almond and mango tree leaves form a major part of the Zanzibar red colobus monkey's diet. These leaves are full of protein, but they also contain phenols. In high doses, these chemicals will poison the monkeys. At the very least, they cause indigestion. But the red colobus appears to have found a remedy. They have learned to eat charcoal. They pick up leftovers from charcoal kilns where it's made for cooking fires. They also relish in charcoal from trees and stumps, charred when pastures are burned. This young colobus learns the antidote from his mother by imitating her. Charcoal acts like a sponge soaking up toxic compounds in the stomach and safely removing them. These monkeys crunch their way daily through several grams of charcoal. The amount they eat compares closely with the recommended dose to treat cases of drug overdose and poisoning in humans. Nobody knows how the Zanzibar red colobus discovered this antidote, which, Apart from humans, they share with few other species. If few animals consume charcoal, clay eating is far more common. Red clay on the banks of the Tambopata River in Peru attracts hundreds of Amazons and macaws. They gather here to purge themselves of the unwelcome side effects of eating seeds and unripe fruit. This natural diet is rich in tannic acids and toxic alkaloids like quinine and strychnine. Soil plays the same role as charcoal. It contains minerals which bind to toxins, removing them from the gut. Clay eating, or geophagy, is one of the most common natural prescriptions in the animal world. The practice extends to elephants, giraffes, rhinos, and many other animals, including primates. Animals actively strive to stay healthy to survive. Many have successful strategies for disease prevention. But what happens when they don't work and an animal falls sick? The tiny island of Cayo Santiago lies just off Puerto Rico in the Caribbean Sea. 
Rhesus macaque monkeys live here on one of the oldest primate research centres in the world. Macaques are not native to the Caribbean. They were introduced from India for research on Cayo over half a century ago. Although food is provided every day, the monkeys spend much of their time roaming the island foraging for plants. Like other animals living in the wild, they're exposed to disease. The subtropical climate and the macaque's own feeding habits make them particularly vulnerable to intestinal parasites. They get infected by accidentally swallowing worm eggs, which can lie dormant in the soil for up to 10 years. The most common symptom of infection is diarrhea, with the sometimes fatal consequence of dehydration. Nonetheless, this colony of macaques enjoys a high reproductive rate and low mortality. In short, they appear able to cope with parasite infection, even to the point, it seems, of treating its symptoms. The macaques take action to stop the runs. Clay soils contain a mineral called kaolin, which helps prevent fluid loss. The monkeys appear to be using it to counteract diarrhoea caused by parasites. The macaques eat so much clay that dozens of clay mines, like this one, have been excavated across the island. Clay may also neutralise toxins in the plants they eat, much like the charcoal eaten by red colobus monkeys on Zanzibar. Macaques' use of it mirrors our own species. Australian Aboriginals, Africans, Chinese and Europeans swallow clay in one form or another to counteract intestinal and digestive problems. If nature is the macaque's pharmacy, it is often ours too. Nature both heals and poisons. Animals and humans alike have learned to wield this double-edged sword. 3,000 years ago, the ancient Greeks knew the benefits of natural poisons. The story goes that in the first century BC, Mithridates, king of Pontus in Asia Minor, immunized himself against poisoning by taking small doses of lethal substances daily. The medieval physician Paracelsus wrote, the dose makes the poison. In other words, too much will kill you, but a little can work magic. Poisons are the foundation of pharmacy. Long before us, animals started exploiting plants' defensive toxins for their own protection against disease and infection. Fields and forests became their medicine cabinets. All sorts of animals, including those on our doorsteps, have learnt to tap into these medical resources. Even the humble hedgehog appears to have come up with a useful plant remedy. Beneath its spines, hedgehogs are prone to ringworm, mites and ticks. 
They're also famous for their fleas. Unlike apes and monkeys, hedgehogs don't have grooming partners, but they have found a substitute. These animals are attracted to strong smells, plants like mint and lemongrass. The hedgehog chews on the leaves, working up a fine lather which he pastes on his body. The reason they perform these strange rituals is unclear. Many plant oils have been discovered to be effective pesticides. Hedgehogs could be using them as a way of controlling their parasites. The lava potion certainly seems to work against fleas. Animals use plants as remedies, but how do they know which ones work? Does the way they smell give them a clue to their effectiveness? In Central America, large troops of white-faced capuchins live in the lowland forests along Costa Rica's Pacific coast. These monkeys rub their fur with plants they collect in the forest. At the Kuru Reserve, they've been seen fur rubbing with different parts of different plants. Clematis stems, Slonia tree pods, Piper leaves and citrus fruits. They do it mainly during the rainy season, humid months when there are lots of insects and microbes about. Chemicals in these plants inhibit fungal and bacterial growth and repel ants, suggesting that the capuchins are using them for their medicinal properties. Dr. Mary Baker, an anthropologist at the University of California, Riverside, began a study into how the monkeys select the right plants. The olfactory cues, the scent, is a stimulation. But I didn't know if there were other cues for recognizing the plants or that might stimulate um, this behavior. So one of the things I wanted to figure out was how are they recognizing these plants? Is it, is it purely olfaction? Or can they rec recognize them visually? Do they use taste? Do they use tactile cues? Following a series of experiments, Mary Baker found that the cue for plant choice is scent and vision. But she also discovered that young capuchins sometimes made mistakes. They chose the wrong plant. This would seem to imply that there is a learning curve. When you look at different troops at different reserves, the same plants are available to the monkeys in these different troops, but each troop uses its own set of plants, which suggests that they learn from other monkeys in the troop which are the ones to rub with. Like the charcoal-eating red colobus, the customs of the capuchin seem to pass from one generation to the next. All four capuchin species fur rub, suggesting that instinct or genetics also play a part. The monkeys know which plants to choose, but that doesn't necessarily mean they also know about the plant's medicinal properties. 
those experiments allow me to conclude that they are very much aware of certain qualities of plants, but what they're getting from that quality might be enjoyment or it might be medicinal, and I just don't know. Could the capuchins just be doing this for pleasure? Cooling themselves down on a hot day? How can we really know why they fur rub or why hedgehogs self-anoint? Our own experience of traditional medicine suggests capuchins do indeed self-medicate. Mary Baker discovered that indigenous people in Central America treat internal disease and skin infections with the same plants used by the monkeys. Man has long been looking to the habits of sick animals to find ways of curing his own ailments. Navajo Indian mythology tells of a plant called Osha. Knowledge of its use came from watching bears which dig up the root, chew it, and rub it on their fur. Leon Secatero is a traditional healer. Many times uh, when some of our people, when they follow the, the uh, bear, uh, there's many ways that if it's hurt or hurting, it tries to find ways to heal itself. And it knows exactly what kind of medicinal plant they need to get, to get or to eat. And this is the way that we are taught. The Osha plant came from uh, the uh, bear. Many of the plants that we know that we use are from the animals. For many, many hundreds and thousands of years, the animal knew about these plants, and they were the one, they were the first one to to, to, to use those plants, so from there, the uh, medicine is given by the animals. The Osha plant holds a special place in Navajo culture. It's taken for stomach flu and to bring down fever and works as an anesthetic and antibacterial. Traditional medicine reflects something of our shared evolutionary past with the animal world. So it comes as no surprise that humans and animals living in the same environment use the same plants to treat the symptoms of similar diseases. Animals, however, use some plant remedies we may never be able to exploit. The Greek philosopher Socrates was killed by the poison hemlock potion he was forced to drink. A caterpillar uses this very same plant to survive an attack by parasites. During the spring, woolly bear caterpillars eat voraciously, building up fat stores in readiness to pupate. When they're good and plump, the parasite strikes. These flies prey on woolly bears, waiting for an opportune moment to inject their eggs into the caterpillar's abdomen. The fly larva develops inside, living off the woolly bear's fat. When it's grown full size, the maggot burrows its way back through the abdomen wall to the outside world. It seems astonishing that any creature could survive such an ordeal. The woolly bear's secret, according to Professor Rick Carbon, lies in their diet. At the Bodega Marine Reserve in California, Rick Carbon caged caterpillars eating two very different plants. Bush lupin, a woolly bear favorite, and poison hemlock. Back at the lab, using an ultrasound monitor to detect which caterpillars had been infested, Rick Carbon made a remarkable discovery. The caterpillar's chances of surviving this 
traumatic event, hatching up to five fly larvae, increases if the caterpillar has been feeding on poison hemlock. The, the caterpillar is also more likely to choose hemlock as a host if it's been parasitized. The sick caterpillar switches food preferences. It actually chooses to eat poison hemlock. Although hemlock doesn't kill the fly larva, it somehow enables the woolly bear to survive attack. Hemlock is full of extremely toxic nitrogenous compounds called alkaloids. A tiny dose is more than enough to kill a large vertebrate, let alone a small caterpillar. These insects seem able to push the alkaloids so quickly through their systems that the toxins don't get taken into their body tissue. Caterpillars don't have brains, but they're still capable of complicated behaviours like responding to changes in their health. Is this a conscious decision of the sort that we would make? Probably not. Rick Carbon puts their actions down to the pressures of natural selection. Natural selection can act on animals like caterpillars that don't have a well-developed central nervous system. No thinking is going on, but the behavior can still be pretty complex and can still be adaptive to the insect or defending itself and changing so that it defends itself against its enemies. Even if the woolly bear doesn't know much about why it's eating hemlock, its actions mean it can recover from the attack, pupate, and eventually metamorphose into an adult moth. Evolutionary pressures force animals to take action to maintain their health. Whether it's done consciously or not, the implications can still be very far-reaching. Here in the Karindi forest in Madagascar, a primate species is believed to be using plants to actively boost reproductive health. Dr. Valentina Carai, an Italian researcher at the University of Pisa, is tracking a species of lemur called Sificus. They're unique to this Indian Ocean island. She's been looking into the diet of pregnant and lactating females and come up with some surprising results. This Sifika mother is eating the leaves of a tamarind species called Kili by the Malagasy. Its leaves are known to have a high tannin content. Tannins are toxic. They bind to proteins in the animal's gut and cause indigestion. But female Sificas hunger for tannins, especially when pregnant or after giving birth. Se invece vengono utilizzati nella giusta quantità per l'animale possono aiutare ad esempio a incrementare If they're used in the right amount, not too much, tannins can be useful for the animal to increase its body weight or to increase milk production when lactating. Vets use them as an astringent to prevent internal bleeding and miscarriages. So tannins can be useful for several reasons for these animals. Not only do Sifica females find tannins in Kili, but in another plant called Fihami. Tannins, like other toxins, also fight intestinal parasites, protection, perhaps, for Sifica fetuses. If, according to Paracelsus, the dose makes the poison, then these lemurs appear to know the limits of their own tolerance. Further research needs to be carried out and extended to other species of lemur. But the strategy is already known to be successful as Sifika females in the Karindi forest give birth every year compared to every two years in other parts of Madagascar. The origins of their behaviour and how they pass it on remain a mystery.
The mystery is buried in our remotest past, when our ancestors shared the same evolutionary ladder as the apes. Their ways of treating sickness and disease offer the snapshot of what our own medicines might have been millions of years ago. But do they understand their actions? We've come full circle and are back in the Mahali Mountains of Tanzania with our closest relatives, the chimpanzees. The rainy season here lasts six months, from November to May. There's little shelter from violent storms and torrential rains. While thick fur provides some protection, they frequently get soaked. This is a difficult time for chimpanzees. They're vulnerable to sickness, catch colds and coughs. With the rains comes a scarcity of good food. Chimps are omnivores. They eat meat, leaves and fruit, things like figs and a sour tasting citrus type fruit called saba fruit. <laughs> But this is not the season of plenty. Ripe fruits are difficult to find. This is a rare treat, not to be shared. Primatologist at Kyoto University, Professor Mike Huffman, and Mahale Park officer, Mohamedi Kalunde, have been working together for some time on the subject of animal self-medication. Their work accounts for much of what we know today about how wild chimpanzees treat sickness. Torrential rains and a poor diet leaves the chimps weak and tired. They're vulnerable to attack by parasites. The chimpanzees get infected by eating leaves and grass contaminated with worm larvae, which thrive in these warm, wet conditions. A month into the rains and many chimps begin to show the telltale signs of parasitic infection, diarrhea and stomach cysts. This female cysts are the likely result of nodule worms burying into the walls of her intestines. But wormy chimps have a remedy for parasites a strange behavior which puzzled scientists for some time until Mike Huffman deciphered it. Basically what, what the apes do is to take a leaf one at a time, very carefully and very slowly, pulling it into the mouth, folding it over two or three times, and then swallowing it. And they'll do this with up to 100 leaves in one sitting. Multiply this by 100, and the stomach doesn't know what to do with it. It's something that can't be digested. 
So it naturally pushes it through the system. And within about six hours, a hundred of these leaves come charging through the intestinal tract, pushing out the worms. These rough leaves act a bit like Velcro. They purge nodule worms from the chimpanzee's innards. Aspilia and some 40 other plants used by great apes for the same ends all have the same physical properties in common. A rough, hairy surface. It looks like Aspilia. I have to clean it out and see. It could be. No, it's Luago. Picus exasperata. At the higher ratio than average, usually we have two leaves per one adult worm. But in this dung, we've got maybe four leaves tops, and we've got 10 worms so far. Across Africa, chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas ascribe to this same treatment. But witnessing it is rare. We know now that chimps self-medicate early in the morning or on an empty stomach and more often during the rainy season when parasites are active. Chimps build sleeping nests at night high up in the tree canopy. But when they're tired or unwell, they often build them during the day to rest in. This young chimp is collecting a powerful medicinal plant. It's not Aspilia, but a plant called Venonia amygdalina. Venonia works in quite a different way from Aspilia. Instead of scouring the gut with bristles, the bitter pith inside the stalk poisons intestinal parasites. The pith contains chemicals which inhibit parasite activity, as well as actually killing some microbes, which also infect humans. The Tongwe people of Mahale use this same plant as medicine. Mohamedy Kalunde knows all about this plant's properties. He's not only a tracker, but a traditional healer. We use this Vanonia plant, which we call Mujonso, to purify blood and for a number of ailments. We boil this herb, then cover ourselves with blankets. As we do this, we inhale the steam, which makes us sweat a lot. This helps in the cure of malaria. Chimpanzees have a complex treatment system. They can combine chemical remedies like Venonia with mechanical ones like Aspilia to combat sickness. On top of that, their daily grooming ritual keeps the skin parasite free. But do primates understand that they're targeting the causes of sickness when they swallow these plants? If they did, we might expect them to use the plants with which they treat some ailments and apply them to cure others, like wounds, for example. But they don't. Capuchins don't use citrus and antihistamines on cuts which would speed their healing. And this rhesus macaque uses only water on her gash. Perhaps even intelligent animals are not aware that they're targeting the causes of their illness, but simply seeking relief from uncomfortable sensations. It's difficult to know that, and in fact, many human societies may not all be aware of exactly what they're targeting when they take medicines that make them better. They all have their ideas of the causes of illness, but it may not always be the correct interpretation. But I think it's safe to say that chimpanzees and other animals indeed do know when they're not feeling comfortable and then coming across ways that make them feel better. So they don't have to know a lot of detail to be able to treat a symptom and to know when that symptom has disappeared.
From the rules of simple hygiene to complex treatment of symptoms, it's only in the last two decades that science has begun to appreciate the evolutionary pressures that force animals to take their health into their own hands. Perhaps animals know more than we think. Only as long as their wild habitats survive will we learn more about the potential of nature's pharmacy and the potency of animal medicine. <laughs>